want to say both good afternoon and good morning. Good afternoon to all of you who are here at the National Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C., and good morning to all our friends at the Sonoma County Museum in Santa Rosa, California. What uh, We're going to do a live webcast uh, from the National Air and Space Museum in Washington to uh, celebrate the 100th anniversary of airmail flight. And the reason we have our friends in Sonoma, California joining us today is because that's where this historic flight took place. S Next to me on stage are two curators from the Smithsonian, two people who know practically everything there is to know about this important occasion. And so let me first introduce, um, on my far left, Dr. Tom Kraut, a curator of aeronautics here at the National Air and Space <laughs> Museum, senior curator of aeronautics. And next to him, uh, Nancy Pope, who is a curator at the National Postal Museum, which is also another Smithsonian museum. So I'm going to turn the stage over to them. Let's give them a nice round of applause <laughs> for coming in on this President's Day weekend. And uh, after the program is over, we'll be happy to take questions from you here in the audience and also from our friends in Sonoma County and anyone else who may be listening in on the web uh, to this broadcast, email us at airmail at si edu and we'll be happy to take some questions after the program and uh, pass them on to our friends up here so Tom take it away thanks I, I, I should say not only does Nancy work at the Postal Museum and I work at Air and Space and Hal runs the affiliates at the Smithsonian but longer ago than any one of the three of us would care to remember we worked together at the what was the National Museum of American History. So, again, as Hal said, my name is Tom Kraut, and I'm the senior curator of aeronautics here at the National Air and Space Museum. 100 years ago, yesterday, in fact, uh, was the the uh, centennial of the most important flight of that airplane that you see on the screen. It's the Wiseman Cook biplane. It's in the collection of the National Air and Space Museum and on view at the National Postal Museum because of its connection to the flight that, uh, that we're celebrating. It's a really interesting airplane. It was built originally in the spring of uh, 1910 and he flew it around a good many times and uh, wound up making this flight in uh, February of 1911 from Santa Rosa, California to uh, Petaluma, California, it was actually built uh, on a ranch, the Laughlin Ranch, near Santa Rosa. Fred Wiseman, who made the flight, was from Santa Rosa. It was, uh, it was his hometown. And uh, so that's the airplane that you see on the screen. We'll come back to that in a minute. But to put it in a little bit of context for you, I thought that um, we would talk about a really what is to me an interesting question. And that is when technologies are new, the extent to which people have to wrestle with what seems apparent to us, and that is what use is this thing? When uh, the phonograph, for example, was new, when Edison's folks first developed it, they had no idea that it was going to give birth to a recorded music industry and find a place in every household and that kind of thing. They really thought it would be a business machine, like a dictograph. And flying was the same way. Next slide. The very first flights were made in France in 1783. And the picture that you see on the screen is of the uh, first flight of a hydrogen balloon, a gas balloon, in August of 1783. And that gentleman that you see on the screen was there that day, Benjamin Franklin. Franklin was uh, the American diplomat living in Paris, um, trying to get French support for the American Revolution. And when Franklin was uh, in France, he was much better known as a scientist than he was as a diplomat or a politician because of the work that he had done with the history of electricity. 
So he was down at the spot where the Eiffel Tower now stands, where the first little helium balloon was flown. And as he was getting ready to pull away in his carriage, he heard someone in the crowd say, well, OK, so they made the thing fly. So what? And Franklin is reputed to have leaned out the window of his carriage and said, sir, of what use is a newborn babe? And that's a neat question you ask about new technology. Next. Uh, we're talking about airmail. In fact, the first airmail ever carried, or at least what usually gets the credit for being the first airmail, was carried from Lafayette, Indiana, West Lafayette, Indiana, actually, in uh, 1859 by the fellow you see, uh, John Wise. And a century later, the post office celebrated that flight with uh, the canceled stamp that you see there. And that's a, to give a photograph of a daguerreotype of that first postal flight. Next slide. But we're here to talk about airplanes. And of course, the airplane begins with these two guys, Wilbur and Orville Wright. It's uh, Orville Wright on your left, Wilbur, I'm sorry, Wilbur Wright on your left, and Orville Wright with the mustache on your right. They begin in 1899. They uh, build over the next three years those three gliders that you see on top of the screen. And then in 1903, the big picture in the center, bottom, they make the world's first flight at Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. And then for the next two years, 1904 and 1905, they, see those, they fly those flanking powered machines at uh, Huffman Prairie in Ohio. So it's really not until the end of 1905 that you have a practical flying machine that'll go up, stay up as long as the pilot wants it to, and perform any maneuvers that uh, the pilot wants it to perform. Go ahead. Over the year or two that follow the Wright brothers' flight, other people take to the air as well. Uh, the fellow in the upper left, Santos Dumont, makes the first public flight in France in 1906. And this fellow down here with the waving figures is uh, Henri Farman, who makes a record flight early in the 1907. So within a year or two of the fact of the, the invention of the airplane by the Wright brothers, other people are starting to take to the air. Next slide. And Americans as well. This is a picture of Glenn Curtis in the air on July 4th, 1908. He's the first guy to fly in America after the Wright brothers. Go ahead. And by 1909, people are really starting to demonstrate what the airplane can do. Uh, on the right are two airplanes that uh, the one on the top actually made the first flight across the English Channel in July 1909. And the one on the bottom is actually an airplane that failed to make that flight. And the big poster on the right is for the great air show at Rams, France, in uh, uh, that high summer of 1909. Go ahead. In America, the same sort of thing was happening. These images all relate to the great air meet at Dumb and Joe's Field in Los Angeles in uh, 1910. And this is important to our story because Fred Wiseman was there. The year before, Fred Wiseman, this young guy from California, had been in Dayton, Ohio at the very moment when the Wright brothers came home in triumph from Europe to their hometown, Dayton. And he was very excited about the Wright brothers and what they had done. The next year, again, he attends in his home state the big air meet at Dome and Joe's Field and gets really excited by it. Next slide. Uh, lots of things are happening late in 1910, early in 1911, leading up to this postal flight. That's Orville Wright with the mustache and the goggles on his hat. And the other guys are student pilots. The number of pilots in the, the nation is beginning to grow. The Wright brothers are operating a flying school. Next. Uh, and that old question of what use is this newborn babe is being asked. In 1910, as you can see, the fall of 1910, this fellow, Phil Parmalee, 
actually flies 50, 100 pounds of silk, two bolts of silk from the Wright Flying School in Dayton to Columbus, Ohio, uh, where they're delivered to an apartment store. So people are trying to figure out what utility this new invention has. Next. This picture was taken late the year before, 1910, in December. And it's uh, the first uh, airplane to take off from a ship. Eugene Ely, the fellow in the hat, made that flight from the USS Birmingham. Next slide. And early the next year, early in 1911, Ely did the opposite half of that trip. He made the first landing uh, on the deck of his ship. And you can see that picture here. Next slide. So people are exploring the military and the civil applications of aviation. This picture was taken in January of 1911. And uh, that fellow, uh, Lieutenant Chrissy, in the uniform, is about to drop the first live bomb ever dropped from an airplane. And in fact, the uh, pilot, Phil Parmalee, is the same guy who flew those bolts of silk from Dayton to Columbus. So all kinds of experiments going on. Go ahead. Another experiment, the first time radio messages are sent and received from an airplane. Uh, you can see the lieutenant sitting there with uh, the radio. And again, it's Phil Parmalee, this Wright pilot who seems to have been involved in lots of attempted firsts. Go ahead. So that brings us down to where we are now, February 1911, and this first airmail flight. And uh, this is the airplane again as it looked then. It's actually the second airplane that Fred Weissman had built. The first one wasn't all that successful. This one was extraordinarily successful. And if you look it up on our museum's website, you'll see it listed as the Wiseman Cook airplane. And that's because after Fred Wiseman had made a good many flights with it, he sold it and it wound up in the hands of a guy named Weldon B. Cook, who uh, flew it for the rest of his career. And uh, so we put the names of these two guys who uh, flew it on the airplane. Go ahead. One of the questions that I thought we'd talk about for a little bit today is why in the world it looks the way it does. When you actually look at it and you compare it to a modern airplane, uh, it looks kind of weird. The tail, for example, is in front of the airplane. This airplane is flying, if it were flying in the air, it would be going from the left of the screen to the right. So the two surface thing on the edge of the frame is, um, the elevator, the front of the airplane, and uh, the rudder back there, or the uh, elevator in the back, is, uh, is the rear of the airplane. And of course, it has two wings. Why does it have two wings? Go ahead. Most airplanes that we know today only have one wing. They're monoplanes. Why does that airplane have two wings? Why is it a biplane? Go ahead. The reason you can see in these two, these are monoplanes, one wing, as you can see. But if you look at the wings, they're both very, very thin wings. And these people building wings out of wood covered with fabric, the wings didn't have very much strength in torsion. In other words, when you were flying, they had a tendency to do this. And obviously, that's a dangerous thing to happen when you're in the air. So these early monoplanes with thin wings were really tough to fly. They presented lots of problems. Go ahead. And as a result, the biplane uh, was introduced. It's why the Wright brothers flew um, biplanes. When you have a single wing like this, the uh, only strength it has against torsion is from uh, the bottom of the wing to the top. When you have a biplane, the strength against torsion is all the way from the bottom of the bottom wing to the top of the top wing. So it has real rigidity, and it doesn't have a tendency to twist the way monoplane wings did. Why is the tail in front instead of the back where we think tails ought to be today? Well, it's because the Wright brothers <clears throat> thought that an airplane with a tail in the front would be more responsive to control. And uh, so they put it in front. Also, 
They wanted a little structure in front of themselves in the event that the airplane crashed, there'd be something in front of them to kind of lessen the blow a little bit. Go ahead. So there's the Weissman Cook again. You can see on the trailing edge, the back of the two wings, those flaps, two on the bottom and up on the top. Those are ailerons, little wings in print. And uh, that's how the pilot controls the airplane. He has a wheel. He pushes forward or pulls back to nose the airplane up or down. He can turn the wheel like this to turn the rudder and back to nose the airplane right or left. And he can turn the wheel and lean, and he works those aileron tabs, and that balances the airplane this way. So that's how these early airplanes were controlled. Go ahead. So here he is. Fred Weissman, uh, like so many of these guys, Weissman has been a bike builder and then a motorcycle builder and enamored of cars before he turned to airplanes. So with that, now that you know a little bit about the airplane and a little bit about him, I will turn it over to Nancy Pope, my colleague. Thank you, Tom, very much. And I'm going to talk about what happens once Fred Weissman gets hooked up with the mail. So you can have the first slide, please. <laughs> While we're waiting for that, oh, there we go. Well, the next slide, please. What you can see here, um, as Tom mentioned, the airplane is currently at the National Postal Museum. It's in our atrium. And uh, this is a photograph, it, photograph of it there. You can see the uh, newspaper clipping off to the right shows Fred Wiseman sitting in the plane. Now we're going to talk about the airmail part of this story. As you can see, this is an airplane that's built for a person. There's not a lot of room for cargo. So when these guys were carrying airmail or carrying mail, they were carrying things on their laps. Uh, next slide. What Fred Wiseman was carrying on his flight ended up being three letters, groceries, which in this case ended up being a sack of uh, coffee, and newspapers, the Press Democrat newspapers. So he didn't have a whole lot of mail because, let's face it, he didn't have a lot of room to put it. But as I said, he had letters, which brings us into the air mail category. And this is a uh, text of one of the letters. And as you can see, this is very much a a boosterism project, um, Petaluma County, uh, sorry, Petaluma, California, and Santa Rosa, California, in Sonoma County, pushing Sonoma County here. So you've got an airplane conceived by Sonoma County brains, which would be Fred and his cohorts, erected by Sonoma County workmen, and carrying mail between two cities in Sonoma County. So this is very much a, a boosterism project for Fred for the two cities, and certainly for the postmasters who were involved. Next slide, please. So the trip itself, Fred Wiseman uh, got his mail, these three letters, the rest of his, his stuff, and got ready. And he took off about uh, 1230 on the 17th. And he got about four miles out of Petaluma before his plane had a little bit of a malfunction. So he had to come down, and as he landed, he hit uh, a little hard on the mud, and he ruined one of his landing skids. So he was down on the ground, only four miles out of uh, Petaluma, when they had to look at fixing the plane. So they repaired the plane, including the landing skid. But at that point, really, it was getting late in the day, and they needed to look at maybe making this a two-day trip. So they took out a huge tarp covered the airplane with it, <clears throat> and the next morning, they took off the tarp, laid it out in front of the airplane, and the airplane took off on it. That was the runway. So back in the air again on the second day, Wiseman's going along. Everything's fine. He's got his little bag of mail and things with him. As he's coming closer to Santa Rosa, he sees a woman out back of her house, and he decides to make the first airmail air delivery takes one of the Press Democrat newspapers, 
and tosses it at her. So we don't know, sadly, who she was, but we do know that was the first airmail delivery in America. Um, sadly for Fred, even though he's got the second day effort and he's fixed the plane, uh, a wire comes loose on the plane, there's more problems, and he has to come down again. But this time he's very close to Santa Rosa, so the people of Santa Rosa decide that counts. And they all go out to meet him, and so it only took Fred two days to go 14 miles. <laughs> but, you know, when you're starting things out, you do the best you can. And you can see here on the, the Google Maps I appropriated, the Santa Rosa Petaluma. It really is just about 14 miles, not very far. In fact, I believe the Sonoma County Museum is leading a hike. Um, <clears throat> so they'll know you could actually walk this much faster than Fred flew it. Next slide. I do want to talk about the planes coming to the Smithsonian. Um, we got the plane from Air and Space, which has lent it to us. The plane came to the Smithsonian in 1948 after it had been on display in the Oakland airport for many years. Once we had it, we uh, were building, the air, sorry, building our exhibits in our museum at the same time. So we had a big atrium that was all very empty brought the airplanes in first, and we took the wings off, <clears throat> excuse me, to bring it in. So you bring in the body and the wings, put the wings back on, and then you can see in the bottom picture, we hoisted it up, along with another airplane that the museum has lent us, and then we went, managed to bring the rest of the exhibits in. So we have these three air, two airplanes that you can see here in a third, um, <clears throat> hanging in our atrium, and they are not coming back down. <laughs> Those are very hard to get in. Next slide, please. One of the main things we talk about when we talk about Fred Wiseman's flight is first. First airmail flight. There is a lot of discussion about this because Fred Wiseman's flight was February 17th to the 18th. Well, also in February 18th, on another part of the globe, we had Henri Picot flying from Allahabad to Nyani in India, carrying mail that had been canceled, <clears throat> 6,000 pieces of mail, which was much more than Fred was carrying. And the issue can be which one of these ends up being the first flight of air mail in the world. Now, I have to say, coming from a postal museum where I have philatelist, philatelic curators I work with, a lot of stamp collectors, they will consider the India flight the first because it was okayed by a higher level of a postal official. The Santa Rosa Petaluma flight was okayed by postmasters. Um, on a personal note, I tend to think the first is Wiseman because date-wise it works out and I don't get all carried away with um, levels of postal officials. <laughs> but I do know there is still a lot of debate and I think good arguments can be made by both sides. I do side with the Wiseman group, however. Next slide. When we talk about levels of postal officials, the highest postal official in the US is the Postmaster General. In 1911, 1912, that's Frank Hitchcock. And you can see him here sitting next to a pilot in an airplane since September 1911, when the first Postmaster General takes a flight. He becomes enamored with it but he also realizes there's a future for aviation and mail. And he starts approaching Congress, asking for $50,000 to pay for experimental airmail service. Next slide. And to kind of encourage Congress, he decides to take advantage wherever he can. There's an aviation meet at late September, early October in Garden City Estates, New York, Long Island. And what Hitchcock does is he says, okay, we're going to have a sub-post office set up there. He puts post boxes all around the area. People can come, take their letters, stamp them, mail them in the post boxes. A postman comes around every hour, grabs them, puts them in a bag, and then they're going to get flown. Now, when we talk about airmail at this point, we're talking not about the airmail we think of. We think of 
You put your letter in the mail in Washington, and it flies to San Francisco. This is not that kind of airmail. This is mail that is canceled, flown by a plane a little bit, then brought back down and put back into the postal stream. So it's really never flown by a plane other than up and down and just for show. But that's still for show, very important. So what Ovington does, Earl Ovington, who's the first official airmail pilot, he's actually sworn in by Hitchcock, he takes the bag of mail up each day and flies it to Mineola, which is just a couple of miles away. And because landing and taking off is still a little tricky, what he does is he drops the mail at the postmaster in Mineola. Postmaster goes out with a big red flag, waves it, Ovington comes over, drops the mail bag. First time he did that, mail everywhere. Bag just blew open. So they started using a canvas bag. From then on, the mail was safe. And you could see on the left or on the right here, this is an envelope that was carried on one of those flights. Next slide, please. Hitchcock and Ovington got along very, very well. You could see Hitchcock giving Ovington one of the good bags of mail. <laughs> then we have at the bottom yet another envelope that was carried on that flight. These two were so enthusiastic about it that Ovington, for decades later on, would sign envelopes for just about any event. Earl Ovington, first airmail pilot. He was very proud of that. And on the 20th anniversary of this um, particular event, there was a show, and Hitchcock and Ovington both showed up and both signed envelopes for that event as well. Both very, very proud of this. Now, what Hitchcock needed <clears throat> was more than show. He needed that money from Congress, and the only way to get it was to show Congress that airmail could work. So what he decided to do next was name Ovington as the first pilot for transcontinental mail. Ovington would fly the mail from New York to California. Well, it turns out that none of the planes that they could find were really up to the, that flight. They knew there were going to be crashes, there were going to be problems. Hitchcock couldn't risk it, risk it, so they called it off. Next slide. So what happened was someone who did not rely on Postal or Congress for the mail, a guy named Calbeth Rogers, got into it. And what got him motivated was a prize that uh, William Randolph Hearst was offering for the first pilot to cross the continent in 30 days by air. So Cal Rogers decided this was a good thing, but he needed some upfront money. So he went to Armour Meats. Armour Meats, for some reason, was trying to sell soft drink. It had a new grape-flavored soft drink called Vin Fizz, which, according to uh, accounts at the time, tasted like sludge. So no wonder they needed lots of advertising. Well, they agreed to sponsor the flight, and Cal was ready to go. He left from Sheepshead Bay on September 17, 1911, and he landed in Pasadena November 5, 1911. And about a month later, he decided he really wanted to finish that flight. So he got his plane up again and went all the way from Pasadena to Long Beach. Next slide, please. Now, how did he get there in, a, in such a short amount of time? Basically, he had a train that followed him. The Cal Rogers train had three cars in it, sleeping car, eating car, and machinery. He had 20 people working on the plane. And these 20 people kept that plane going because Cal crashed or landed 70 different times badly. He was in the hospital 16 times. This was not an easy flight. In fact, by the um, time he was about two-thirds along the way, he knew he wasn't getting the Hearst money anymore. So it was, he had, you know, too many time, too much time had gone by. So he was just doing it to do it. But he did make it 4,000 miles. Took him 84 days, and he spent out of those 84 days only 82 hours actually in the air. And you can see on the right the list of the different towns he went through to get there. Next slide, please. But again, back to just the whole idea from Hitchcock of promoting mail and promoting all these different uh, ideas of connecting mail and the aviation area. You have fairs such as the St. Louis 1911 Fair, 
Well, you have a couple of pilots who agree to carry mail from a postmaster, and they will make these flights anyway, but you know, add mail to it so you get a little bit more of a storyline. The postmasters kind of help Hitchcock's uh, need to make this connection between mail and the uh, aviation industry, as it were, at this point. Next slide. Some more um, airmail flights from 1911. Rochester, Savannah, and uh, Fort Smith, Arkansas. Next slide, please. But it's 1912 when things get serious. And in 1912, you can see a whole bunch of cities are now getting these uh, special airmail flights as part of their aviation meets. And this is because Hitchcock pushed so hard in 1912 for his postmasters to connect the mail and airplanes. He sent memos out to them saying, anytime there's a meet anywhere near you, get out there and put a bag of mail on it. He wanted mail everywhere. So 1912 was a big, big push. Next slide, please. Among those who were flying the mail, Walter Brookins, who flew the mail both at the 1911 uh, San, uh, St. Louis meet, as well as Altoona, Pennsylvania. Brookins had been taught by the Wright brothers, um, and in fact was one of their early stars, and considered one of the first uh, student pilots. Next slide. Lincoln Beachy, for the other side, as it were, he was Glenn Curtis's star pilot. He flew uh, mail at a couple of different meets. He flew a lot, but didn't carry the mail at all of them. What would happen every once in a while is the pilots would go up to test um, really the conditions, and they would come down and say, really, it's not going to be good. I'm not going to fly during this meet, or I'm not going to make this particular trip. But the postmasters don't know that because they're getting everything ready. So once in a while, like you have on the left, you'll have a postmaster getting a card all ready. It's canceled. Everything's going to go. Might have written on it, you know, which meet and what date but then it never flew. So philatelists need to be very, very careful when they're buying these things to make sure they're buying things that actually did fly. Next slide. Charles Wash, who was taught by Beachy to fly, um, also carrying mail at a couple of meets. In this case, um, an Ohio and a Benton Harbor meet. I didn't mention it, but Lincoln Beachy actually died while um, flying He during the Pan Pacific Exposition in 1915. Charles Wash also was killed in a crash, in his case, in Galesville, um, Illinois. Next slide. The pilot with my favorite name of all, Farnham T. Fish. Um, he also was a very popular pilot. First time he flew the mail, he was 16 years old. He was known as the boy aviator. And you can see with uh, the envelopes that we have here, not just the postmasters and the avi aviators getting involved, but also now some of the groups that are sponsoring the meets are asking postmasters to come and make, make mail a part of the, uh, the aviation meet itself. So in this case, we have the Milwaukee newspaper, and then we have the Aerial Club of Illinois, both starting to um, say, you know, let's have an air mail part of this. Get the postmaster here. We'll do one more fun event. Next slide. Walter Edwards was kind of an odd duck. He was the son of a very wealthy New York banker. His real name, Walter Edward Kittle, changed his name to Walter Edwards and went off to have a flying career. And he was one of the first to fly the mail in the Pacific Northwest. And in his case, it was flying it across the Columbia River from Portland, Oregon to Vancouver, Washington. Next slide, please. Uh, Joseph Stevenson is the cautionary tale for all of these. Um, a lot of these airplanes are being built with groups of people based on solid designs. Sometimes you'll have an individual that will build a plane, think he's know what he's doing. In Stevenson's case, he did not build himself a very good plane. And he did actually attend this one particular meet in Birmingham, Alabama, agreed to carry the mail, but his plane, uh, plane practically fell apart um, in midair, and he jumped out as it was crashing and, and was killed. He was the first pilot killed while trying to carry the mail. Next, Next slide, please. Now, this is the novelty of the whole thing. As you notice, the 1912 flights were all over the place. 58 airmail flights in 1912. Hitchcock pushing very, very hard. 
Um, what happens is President Taft is out of office, and now President Wilson comes in in March of 1913. President Wilson's postmaster general, a fellow named Albert Burleson, he likes airmail as a thought. He thinks it's po got possibilities, but he really doesn't see the use of all these little fairs and events. So where you had Hitchcock really out there pushing his, air, his postmasters to get involved, Burleson steps back and says, my fight needs to be in Congress. You know, if you as a postmaster want to do something, I really don't care, but I'm not necessarily going to give you any money or any help for it. So as you can see, the number of airmail flights start to dwindle until you get down to 1916, where, of course, um, aviators and the airplanes and everything's starting to focus a little bit more on all the action that's happening in Europe with World War I. So airmail flights really don't go anywhere after the 1912 year. That was just the promising year for exper experimental airmail service. Next slide, please. What happens uh, after the war, or actually close to the end of the war, is Albert Burleson finally gets Congress to put some money towards airmail service. And uh, this is from May 15th, 1918, the first regularly scheduled airmail service anywhere in the world, happened in the U.S., happens between D.C., Philly, and New York. You have a Ginny airplane here in the center, which is taking off from the polo grounds here in D.C. Um, if you know the D.C. area down by the Potomac, this is really kind of where the FDR memorial is. And you see at the bottom here, um, Burleson is actually Chance, Merritt O. Chance, postmaster of D.C. holds the mailbag. Next to him is Albert Burleson. And then you see President Wilson and his wife. They were all on hand for this historic flight of May 15, 1918, where mail would be carried officially by the post office department, although they were using Army pilots and Army planes. And we also have um, a stamp, for those of you who do know, that we call the Inverted Jenny, which is from this exact um, time period. The stamp was ordered for the specific flight, and when it was uh, printed, part of the sh one of the sheets was printed back or upside down. Thus, the airplane looks like it's flying upside down, a very rare American inverted error. Next one. Then our next slide. These are the first professional postal pilots. The uh, Army flew the mail from May until August. And in August 12, 1918, the Post Office Department took over everything. They took over creating the route, which routes they would use, hiring the pilots, training the pilots, finding the airplanes, purchasing them. Everything now became a Post Office Department project. And second from the left is a guy named Benjamin Lipsner, who actually worked with the first pilots. He's not a pilot himself but he is with the Army. He resigned his Army position to become the first superintendent of the airmail service. And the first airmail pilots from left to right are Eddie Gardner, Maurice Newton, Max Miller, and Robert Shank. All of these, except Robert Shank, would actually die while carrying the mail. It didn't get any easier and safer. Uh, next slide, please. Here you have an image of Max Miller in a standard airplane built in Elizabeth, New Jersey. And he's painted a mailbag on the side of his airplane. And the nice colorful symbol was what the post office used to symbolize the airmail service. And at the bottom is uh, Miller taking off from College Park, Maryland. Now, College Park has a wonderful aviation museum that is, uh, is open. It's wonderful. They do a great job. They celebrate these flights as well as earlier Army flights. So if you haven't been there, I suggest you go. And I think that is it. Next slide. Yes. And we have basically have come all the way from Fred Wiseman, his press Democrat, his letters, and a bag of coffee to these pilots who are now taking printed or taking um, cards and letters between Washington, New York, and DC on a regularly scheduled basis in basically just seven years. So a lot has happened as these pilots move on, but we have a lot to thank 
Fred Wiseman for doing it for us first. And I'd like to thank everybody here. Um, and I tell you, we were, are going to have questions. And I'd like to turn it over now to Harold Kloster, who will be handling the Q&A part of this for us. Thank you. Well, good. Well, thank you very much, Nancy and Tom. Let's give them a nice round of applause. The story of airmail. Very interesting. Thank you so much. Again, we're taking questions from our friends at the Sonoma County Museum. We're happy to take questions here from our live audience. And if you'd like to ask a question, come stand right up next to me and we'll, we'll give you the microphone when it's your turn. And anyone else who may be listening to this webcast or tuning in, uh, send us an email at airmail at si.edu. So our first question comes from the Sonoma County Museum. Uh, and the question is, how do Weissman's flight and other early flights like it compare to what was going on in Europe at this time? Was there the same plane mania going on there in Europe as there was here? Well, there certainly was. And in fact, while the airplane was invented in America by the Wright brothers, again, as we saw first flights in 1903 and a practical airplane by 1905, and uh, as late as 1908, the Wright brothers were still uh, the kings of the hill. They were still the best around. But by 1909, 1910, the Europeans, who had been inspired by the Wright brothers, were actually sweeping past it. And uh, by the time the First World War comes along in 1914, America is actually in second place behind uh, the European nations in terms of flight technology. When, uh, when America enters the First World War in 1917, all American pilots who flew into combat in World War I flew in airplanes that had been designed and mostly built in, uh, in Europe. So I might, I might just add, Nancy was talking about Cal Rogers mm -hmm. and the first transcontinental flight. That airplane is here at the National Air and Space Museum as well, upstairs in our Pioneers Gallery. So you can take a look at it, too. And I actually like to just get onto this, talk about airmail, because there was the flight in India that I talked about, but there were also airmail flights in 1911 in England, in France, and Germany. So everybody's really kind of getting in on the action at about the same time. Okay, great. Well, we have another question from the Sonoma County Museum, uh, and I think it's for you, Tom. Is the National Air and Space Museum willing to incorporate Fred Wiseman into its story on early flight, adding it to the Ovington story? Oh, it certainly is of, of interest. We don't talk as much about... Um, the very early airmail flights here, as they do at the Postal Museum, we have a, a thing on Earl Ovington down the hall here, and uh, some of the equipment that he wore, and so on and so forth. And of course, we have Fred Wiseman's airplane, and we certainly talk about that flight on the web, on the National Air and Space Museum website. You can go take a look at the airplane and uh, read all about the, the flight there. Okay, and, and uh, we also have another Fred Wiseman plane, I believe, uh, from the Smithsonian on display uh, not far from San Francisco at the Hiller Aviation We do. Museum. It's not a Fred Wiseman that? airplane, but it's an airplane that was built at about the same time in California. Uh, it's the Malpin Lantieri Black Diamond, it's usually called. And as you say, it's on exhibit now at the uh, Hiller Museum. Okay, so you can, uh, there are parts of the Smithsonian on display in other, in other areas around the country. Um, anyone here in our audience have a question they'd like to ask? Okay, well, we have a very active audience in Sonoma. <laughs> it, it must be Hank, they must be very uh, interested in this. Was Weissman's flight just a stunt? Did it have any significance beyond that, since it didn't lead to the establishment of an airmail route? Well, again, almost everything airplanes did in those days before 1914, 1915 was a stunt. I mean, airplanes weren't capable of doing a whole lot of useful work. They couldn't carry very much of a load. They couldn't fly very far. And so, as I tried to indicate, and as Nancy indicated, 
what they were doing basically was exploring the utility of these machines. What could they be used for? Military observation. One of the things you could do with them, because letters are light, obviously, you could fly in the mail and demonstrate, again, the potential that the airplane was going to have one of these days. Yeah, and I would say to that, basically, I, I'm not sure I would call it a stunt, just mm -hmm. a stunt, because every single time that someone was flying and carrying a piece of mail, there's a congressman in that district, there's a senator in that state, there's two more votes in Congress that might be looking favorably when the Postmaster General comes up and says, I need $50,000 to start an airmail service. So it's a stunt, I guess, yes. And it certainly was, as I said, it's kind of boosterism thing for Sonoma County. But each time they would do this, that's one more piece of layering that they need to convince Congress that this is a service that the country could actually use. Okay. Very good. And again, from the Sonoma County uh, Museum, is it true that Weissman's plane was the first one built in California? If so, isn't that just as significant as Weissman's flight being the first airmail flight? Well, the answer to that one is yes and no. Fred Weissman did build what probably was the first airplane built in California, but it was his first airplane. The airplane we're talking about was actually his second airplane. So the airplane that's on uh, display, our airplane that's on display at the National Postal Museum uh, wasn't the first built in California. It actually, it does have another first, if memory serves. I think the Weissman Cook was the first airplane to actually fly in Nevada, in fact. Okay. Some wonderful questions from Sonoma. We thank you very much. You're, uh, you're very clearly engaged in this. We appreciate that. Well, here's another question from our Sonoma County uh, audience. <laughs> Were there any female pilots who delivered airmail? And who was the first woman airmail pilot? Do we know that? No, the first woman was uh, um, Harriet? No. Well, Harriet Quimby um, was one of the first American uh, pilots. Oh, okay. uh, the first um, uh, woman pilot, in fact, was, uh, was in France. But I'm trying to think about this in terms of the airmail well, connection. Well, the airmail is Catherine Stinson. Catherine. That's right. Catherine Stinson yeah. did carry the did carry air mail. Catherine. Catherine, the Stinson sisters, Marjorie and Catherine, were pioneer, real pioneer aviators. One of them had learned to fly with the Wright brothers, and uh, the other basically was a Curtis pilot. But you're right, Catherine yeah. Stinson. And Catherine carried the mail um, at least three times right. in shows. There was one time that she was trying to carry it from Chicago to New York, um, but ended up landing, I think, uh, and in eastern, or sorry, in western New York, and never yeah. quite finished the flight. But she did certainly carry it in shows at least three times. Okay, and her name again was? Oh, Catherine Stinson. Catherine Stinson. Okay, well, now we have uh, Jeff in Washington, D.C. For you, Nancy, how much did it cost to send letters on the first airmail flight? And did the rates differ from the ground service? Well, the flights that we're talking about the early pre-1918 flights, there was no separate rate because there was no official airmail service. So, so they cost whatever it would cost you to send a letter to wherever you were sending it. But after 1918, or with the May 15th flight, the actual cost was 24 cents, and that's why they needed this brand new stamp, which I told you about. Um, the cost was so high that not a lot of people were using it. So the uh, rates did come down about two or three times before it settled on a fairly standard rate. But uh, <clears throat> as I said, for these early flights, there was no special airmail rate because there was no real airmail. <laughs> okay. Now we, we have a question coming in from the, uh, the Royal Military Museum in, uh, in Brussels. Huh. We, we truly have an international audience here. We, we thank you, our friends in Brussels, uh, for uh, tuning in. And uh, your question from the Royal Military Museum is, we have a large aviation hall. Sorry, uh, waiting for this to clear up a little. <laughs> we have a large aviation hall in our federal museum in Brussels, too. Compared to landborne mail, how expensive was the airmail then for the citizens who wanted to send it? That's 
roughly the, the same question that you just yeah, answered. Yeah, exactly. But, um, prior to 1918, it was the exact same price because mail was not really traveling its distance to be delivered by air. It was just going up and down at fairs and at aviation meets. So the mail was, it cost the same that it would cost you to send it by land because, in essence, it was being delivered by land. But after 1918, or May 15th, 1918, the first price was 24 cents okay. per ounce. All right. Well, we're delighted to know that folks from uh, from our uh, colleague museum in, uh, in Brussels are sharing this discussion with us. Uh, okay. Now, and again, another question from Sonoma. The Postal Museum website timeline seems to indicate that U.S. airmail began in 1903. What even preceded the Weissman flight? That just has to be a problem with the website, to be honest with you. We'll have to look at it because it did not. <laughs> okay, so we're, we're taking a pass on that one, and you'll have to send that question. Yeah, yeah, we'll have to look to our web guy and see what's going on there. Okay, so th that's at your museum? At it sounds, yes, yes. Yeah. We do okay. have an aviation timeline on our website. Okay, so, so we, we appreciate someone who uh, has been a, a, a careful student of, really? of what goes up on our websites. and. Every now and then we do get caught, so we thank you, and we'll we'll go back and look at it. Uh, again, from the Sonoma County Museum, I just want to remind folks here we have a few more minutes. If anyone in the audience does have a question, you're more than welcome to join me at the microphone and ask it. Uh, but again, our friends in Sonoma County uh, write that it seems as if military ambitions drove several of these early flights. How much do you think World War I had an impact on the development of flight? Oh, wow. When, uh, when the inventors of the airplane, the Wright brothers, and the early, other early pioneers thought about what utility this thing could have, the one thing they all came up with was military application. You couldn't carry much of a load. You couldn't fly very far. But you could. You were flying at altitude, so you ought to be able to reconnoiter the enemy, find out what was happening out there and that kind of thing. And so almost all of them initially recognized that the real market for the airplanes was going to be the government. You might sell a handful of airplanes to wealthy sportsmen and that kind of thing, but your real market was going to be the, the, uh, the governments of the world. Okay. And I just said, for the airmail part of that, um, after the end of World War I, you had all of these airline manufacturers that had been going great guns producing uh, airplanes for the war effort. Suddenly, no war, no takers for the airplanes. Post Office Department ends up being the one group that they start selling airplanes to. Right. Um, and in fact, my favorite story is uh, Boeing himself was going to give up the airplane manufacturing business because there was no money in it after the war. But then through um, airmail contracts, he finally made enough money to actually become Boeing Industries. Okay. So the I, Post Office Department really helped the uh, aviation nation out after World War I. As Nancy says, after World War I, the government market wasn't as large anymore. The war was over. People were cutting back on defense spending and that kind of thing. And so the aviation industry really went into the doldrums. And it really isn't until the appearance of the DC-3 in the 1930s that you have an airplane that can make money for an airliner without a postal subsidy. The postal subsidies were so important that it, it wasn't the manufacturers so much as those primitive airlines, which actually would not have existed if they hadn't been able to get that subsidy for carrying the mail. That's what kept, their, kept them above water. Hal? Uh, you must uh, have very good ESP there, Tom, because you anticipated exactly my question, which was, what was the role of the airmail service in the establishment of commercial aviation in the United States? Well, again, in terms of the subsidies, it was incredibly important, but the Postal Service did other things as well. Uh, working with the U.S. Army Air Services, for example, the Postal Air Service pioneered uh, transcontinental and even local air routes, uh, air route marking programs, and uh, 
and those kinds of, of things. The, um, as long as the airmail service remained in operation until the early 1920s when uh, the postal subsidies began, um, it, it really was what helped to establish commercial aviation in the U.S. Yeah, the uh, commercial aviation, once the post office contracts turned basically the mail over to private industry in 1927 and on after that, you had this industry that now looked for postal trained pilots. They looked um, at a map of the U.S. where the post office had really set up the airmail routes and, as Tom said, all of the navigation systems. So the post office department for this 1918-1926-7 period basically established the groundwork that private aviation then used to grow and flourish. Okay, thank you. I think we have only time for one more question, so I'll take that. I'll give it mm -hmm. to you and maybe ask you to look ahead a little bit. We're celebrating 100 years of airmail flight, literally, this weekend is the 100th anniversary. What does the future look like for airmail? A lot of talk about how email is replacing mail in general. And uh, I don't know when airmail might have, uh, if we have figures on the total tonnage or number of, well, number actually, of letters actually sent, but what do you think about the future of airmail? Actually, the official airmail ended in the mid-70s. Right when all mail became, you know, just first class mail riding on airplanes. Right. Since then, the post office department has actually been using airplanes the less and less and relying a bit more on um, train and truck traffic. But the Postal Service still carries today 60% of the world's mail, which is an amazing thing, and a lot of that obviously in, in air and aviation. What the, the department looks at now is not so much where airmail is going, but there's anybody who could read the newspaper, they're looking at how are they getting this a massive deficit and how are they going to try and keep things going themselves to keep the mail going in the next 10, 20 years. Um, airmail and aviation being kind of a side note on that. One of the really interesting things to me, we've talked about airmail, but because mail was relatively light, at least one or two letters are relatively light, that kind of uh, publicity helped other technologies as well. In the 1930s, for example, rocket mail was a huge deal. Uh, somebody you know, would shoot off a rocket just a few hundred yards with a, a letter or two in it, and they'd get publicity for it. And uh, we have a real uh, collection of rocket mail, just like air mail, that was flown by these rocket pioneers in the 1920s and 30s. And uh, so, you know, the whole notion of using the idea of mail to publicize a new technology, to demonstrate, you know, maybe we can't do much now, but gosh, just think about the future. Uh, well, it was real important. There was a fun one that uh, Postmaster General Arthur Summerfield did in the late 50s when he worked with the Defense Department to put mail on a nuclear missile. So they took the nuclear warhead out of a Regulus-1 missile, put in two containers that were filled with mail, put it onto the USS Barbero, and fired it off to Mayport, Florida. And that was the first and actually only official missile mail flight. Okay. Uh, yeah, they've, they've done interesting things in the past. Okay, well, I think that's an interesting note to end on. We thank you very much, Tom Crouch from the National Air and Space Museum, Nancy Pope from the National Postal Museum. Your knowledge and your enthusiasm for this subject uh, was very impressive, and we thank you for taking the time to spend with us here at the National Air and Space Museum to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the U.S. Airmail. And of course, our friends in Santa Rosa, California, at the Sonoma County Museum, this whole program was your idea. So we thank you very much for linking yourselves with the Smithsonian and and congratulations on all the family activities that you have planned out there to celebrate your role in a, a very historic moment in American history. And thank you all to the live audience here at the National Air and Space Museum for joining us. Have a good afternoon.